Hi everyone, welcome to our third Hangout with the Book discussion. We're here at the Garfield Heights branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library to discuss the supernatural thriller Horns by Joe Hill. I'm Carol Van Vliet, a librarian here at the branch. Hi, my name is Becky Wendelin. I'm also a librarian here at Cuyahoga County Public Library. Um, we hope you'll join in our discussion. You can submit your questions and comments about our discussion using the Q&A feature in the Hangout. You can also vote on other people's questions if you'd like us to talk about them by clicking on the plus one next to the question. We'll hopefully try to get to all of your questions as best as we can. And uh, just so you know, we will be talking about many details from the book, so if you haven't read it yet, there will be spoilers. We'd also like to invite another staff member to our discussion. Welcome, Angeline. Hello. My name is Angeline Kapfer, and I'm also a librarian with the Cuyahoga County Public Library. Glad to be here. Oh, we're glad to have you. Thanks for joining us. Um, so let's dive right into the questions. Um, I read an interview where Joe Hill described horns as a book where the devil is good. Um, and it kind of makes sense because Igg's horns are, they're more like a superpower to me than a curse. Um, right. What do you think? Were they a curse or a blessing? I mean, they kind of gave him this insight and allowed him to figure out who actually killed his girlfriend. So I kind of saw it as a, something positive rather right. than negative. Right, that's, that's a good point. And what did you think? Well, it seemed that they were a blessing and a curse. He was already feeling alienated from the community because he was the main suspect in Marin's murder. Um, the horns alienated, alienated him further, but um, they also led him to the truth of what happened. So in that way, they were a blessing. And also he got to hear everyone's truth and see everyone's real devil. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's a good point because actually, um, in the beginning, is a kind of the first quote before the book even begins. Um, is from another novel, and it says, "Satan is one of us so much more so than Adam and Eve." Kind of. Um, I don't know if this is Joe Hill's own beliefs, kind of creeping into the book, but you know, everybody has a little evil in them, which Ig does find out when he goes over to his parents' house, and they all have these kind of horrible thoughts about him, thinking he's a killer and wishing he would just kind of go away. Okay, right. Um, so, yeah, there would, were definitely good aspects of the horns, but then also negative things. Um, right. But right. I never, I wasn't really clear why he started growing the horns. I know it happened. He has this kind of vendor that he goes on where he gets drunk and desecrates the cross, you know, the Virgin Mary statue. But why the horns? I mean, why does he... Right. I mean, I had the same question. Well, why did he grow the horns? And, well, we needed that to happen for this story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I also read an interview about where Joe Hill said, the writer's first job in horror fiction is to convince the reader there's a real person there to care about. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. Did you care about any about any of the characters? I did. Um, I really cared about Marin, even though she was only really there in the flashbacks. She mm -hmm. wasn't. A, I mean, she was a character in the book, but um, she wasn't ever in the present. Um, right. I mean, I think I was felt most for the most empathy for her. Mm -hmm. um, although I didn't. It started to grow on me throughout the book. I mean, at first I thought he was just kind of this evil. Not evil person, but he was just kind of this loser with no wayward no, at the yeah, moment, yeah. And which no for plans. Good reason, I right. his girlfriend was killed, and he was accused of the murder. Right. But um, but once I we got flashbacks into his earlier life, I kind of felt for him more and liked him more. How right, about you? Right. Well, I think all along, maybe not from the very beginning, but pretty pretty soon into the book, I I felt for Egg. I was rooting for him. Um, well, it's, of course, especially after I. I discovered that Lee was the killer, then I was really on board with Egg and mm -hmm, really yeah. liked him. Angeline, did you have a character that you cared about? Um, I really liked Terry. For most of the characters, I agreed with you, Carol. Um, um, at first, what pulled me through the story was the mystery of the horns and why were they there and why was he growing them and did he really do this? Um, it, the way they painted the story in the beginning was that Ig was a pretty awful person, but then as we learn more about him, you begin to care about him more. For some reason, I was drawn to the brother, and, and he was the character that stuck out to me. Marin, I mean, I, I liked her as a character, but she was a little too perfect. Mm, yeah. yeah, that is true. I mean, you never really get to know her. She's kind of this 
I don't want to say stereotype, but yeah, she's too perfect and too yeah. see her through Ig's, Ig's eyes, and you don't really get the truth. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know. Right, right. Um, did you ever think Ig was guilty at all? I mean, it seemed to me like Hill was pretty clear that Ig was innocent, and there was never any mystery there that Ig had nothing to do with Marin's murder. Did you ever doubt him throughout the book? I didn't. I didn't. You know, first at the beginning of the book, you're trying to figure out what the heck's going on, and um, yeah, I never got the impression that that Ig was guilty. Somehow, the author was able to make that clear to me, at least, that he was not the guilty one. And uh, yeah, yeah. How about you, Angeline? Um. Well, at first, I wasn't sure if he was guilty or not because he woke up from this bender, this blackout bender, where he wasn't sure what happened. Right. And you know, then wakes up with these horns. He had this relationship with Glenna, that a little um, unsavory, and, right. <laughs> and you know he wasn't really compassionate and caring towards her. So he he already had you know in the beginning of the story we already had this um, you know we knew that he got drunk and he had a blackout. So and then he had this you know rageful moment. I mean he loved Marin so much. Who knows if he flipped that night and just mm -hmm. went on the and killed her. I mean, he says he didn't, but his mother thought he did. I mean, his mother thought he did. Um, right. Everyone thought he did. So right. I didn't find him right away. I wanted to find out for, I mean, of course he was, he said he, could. no one ever says, yes, I did it. So I was, <laughs> that was true. Right, right. Um, the one thing that did bother me a little bit was um, at the end of the book, Ig's name, I kind of wanted his name to get cleared and everybody to know he isn't this horrible person, he didn't kill Marin, but mm -hmm. that doesn't really ever seem to happen and the public doesn't ever learn that Lee was really the one who murdered Marin. Right, right. And that just kind of right. frustrated me a little bit. Right. I wanted him to get some... Right. And that never crossed my mind until you brought it up, but I think you're right. Lee should have been been known to be the killer, but I guess I was just satisfied that, that he was dead at the end of the yeah, book. That was but that's a good point. If, if the story was to have continued, I certainly would have been upset had Lee's name not, not been told as the one who was guilty. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed the humor that was sprinkled throughout the book. I don't know if you guys did too. One of my favorite lines was, um, this is Terry talking to Ig, it's hard to be desired by women and feared by men when your primary skill is playing America the Beautiful on the trumpet. Yeah, I, I just thought that was really funny. Yeah, there's definitely some good humor in there. Right, and then when um, Ig and um, Lee are at Ig's pool and Ig says to, or uh, Ig chokes on a sandwich, he says, uh, for most people it's just lunch, but for you it's another self to get you, another chance to get yourself killed. I just thought that was really funny. Yeah. And I did think these, these lines were funny and several others too, but for some reason the humor just didn't work for me in the book as, as part of the story. I just felt they were a little out of place. I don't know if, if you felt that way too. Um, it was interesting because I read this book about a year ago and then I reread it for the discussion and... Um, the second time I kind of picked up on the humor more is like more being tongue in cheek, whereas oh, the right. first the first time I kind of took it at face value and thought this doesn't really fit with the book. But I mean, it was funny how Hill kind of crossed genres like it's horror, but it's a thriller and it's supernatural. Mm -hmm. It also has this very humorous um, tongue in cheek aspect right. to it, and right. it's, it's just interesting how in a horror movie or a horror novel, but also movies, I guess you do sometimes have, I mean, you need comic relief at some oh, point, right. so you're not just constantly right. um, on the edge of your seat. But I think that's a good point, that, that he really did cross over through some, some genres and didn't just stick to a straight thriller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Angeline, I think you, you kind of thought the same thing from a discussion we had earlier that... Uh, right. Right. I thought um, the humor did catch me off guard that when I was reading it. At first I thought, was that supposed to be funny? Am I allowed to laugh at this? Right, right. But it, it, yeah, I mean, he, does, he, does, he writes really well, and, it, and, and I thought the humor was well placed because, because of the characters and how they interacted with one another. Right, right. Um, did you, does the devil kind of cliches. Did those get to you after a while? <laughs> they did. They did. I, I was a little bit disappointed with um, the Lucifer matches and the devils on, I forget whose underwear it was, but someone had devils on their underwear, one of the girls obviously. No, me. Well, anyway, there was devils on someone's underwear. <laughs> and um, 
What else was? Oh, when he went when Ig went back to his parents' house. And he found deviled eggs in the refrigerator. I just thought a little bit too cliche. I mean, maybe that was part of his humor too. Maybe we were just supposed to think yeah. that was funny. And uh, notice, notice that he was doing that on purpose. Yeah. But um, um, she want to talk about the. There are a lot of biblical references. Well, right. I did notice that. I, I'm sure you guys noticed it too. But of course, the name Ignatius, Saint Ignatius. Um, Gideon, that's you know the Gideon Bible, uh, it actually means destroyer, which I thought was interesting. Um, there were locusts in the story in the parking lot when Ig goes to confront Lee in his office. Um, the name of the bar was the Pit, which I thought well is that you know a reference to hell. Um, it was funny because you and I were talking about the book. I think it was when you first started reading it, but you accidentally called Marin Mary, and it never oh, occurred to me that right. maybe I mean she does have this. Could it either be the Virgin Mary or Mary Magdalene? I mean, depending, like Ig had this, you know, he she was dressed in white the first time they met, and she was very oh, really innocent. Good point. But Lee kind of thought she was a tease, and you right. know, in his messed good up point. mind, was, oh, she's just teasing me and stringing right. me along, almost right. like Mary Magdalene, who's yeah, right, not as pure, right. But good, um, good, good, good point, yeah. I also, oh, I was going to say, I noticed a lot of the biblical references as well, and I kept waiting for them to tie in, but they seemed to be more mm -hmm. sprinkled. Um, like, right. well, we what the devil digs. I thought, oh, okay, here's another clue, or um, oh. <laughs> okay. his name, and, 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 and um, just uh, the locust. The locust, I remember thinking, oh, I know this from the Bible. This is going to go somewhere, and then I waited for the other yeah. graphs to come, and they didn't quite come. Right, so, right. Notice they yeah. were, but I kept talking. They were like like a mystery. Like, what is this tying into? And I thought, right, they were just um, filler yeah. rather than yeah. Yeah, he used them, but he didn't didn't go anywhere with them. Like Gideon was the name of the town, and I and you had said it meant destroyer, but didn't really fit. I mean, like the town. Yeah, the, was the town to destroy? I don't know. It was yeah, the site of destruction. I don't know. Right. Maybe that's. And I was also thinking about why he was driving a gremlin. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm reading too much into the the names of things, yeah. but that they did catch my attention. Well, and it's funny. Um, I don't know. If any of the audience knows that Joe Hill is Stephen King's son. Probably right. know that by now. But um, he did throw in like a little Carrie reference at one point. Oh. There, just a little blip. But it's funny because his dad's such like. Such a pop culture icon, right. you know, you can't really avoid even making references to, right. to Carrie because it's just so right. ingrained in people's head. You know, right, so right. Um, so speaking, I guess you kind of touched on Marin a little bit. Did you think her decision to break up with Egg because she had cancer was believable to you? I mean, to me, it was a little selfish of her to kind of leave him hanging the night before he's supposed to go to London. Right. Um, and right. then. The letter that he later found in the attic or in her bedroom or wherever it was. Do you think he was ever meant to? Like, if she hadn't been killed by Lee, if she had just died from cancer at some point, would he have been given that letter? Right. How would he have out? found yeah. it? Right. Right. I I just was really sold on the fact that Ig and Marin had this amazing relationship. They talked about what they were going to name their children, and I. It didn't work for me that she would have broken up for with him because of breast cancer. I just thought in that type of relationship they would have shared it. They would have, you know, they would share the problem and mm -hmm. worked through it, and yeah. he would have been gone with her to chemo. And I just, it didn't make sense to me. What did you think, Angeline? Well, I thought they were young, and that to me okay. sort of for like a young, like, you know, when you're like high school sweethearts and you have your whole life planned out. Um, I do think that her breaking up with him right before he was going to leave was a was a sort of a poor choice. I'm, I'm, I, you know, it would have made a little more sense if she would have let him go and then like broke up with him over text or something like that. <laughs> right. I kept thinking that it that maybe it was Lee that really talked her into the breakup, but then we find out later that it was the cancer that was the, yeah. that was the reason. And the first time I read it, I really didn't like her at that point when they had the conversation at the pit because I thought, oh my gosh, she is sleeping with Lee. She doesn't oh. want to be with Lee. I thought that. Right. And then we find out about the cancer and you feel bad for her. Yeah. Right. You know, in a way. right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and th I th thought I'd mention that I, you know, I went along with this whole horn thing uh, initially. I could I could suspend my belief for that, but then when we got to the the part of the book where there's snakes and kind of magic seemed to happen there at the foundry, I, I thought it was a little too fantastical. Did you have problem? I did. Um I have to admit, I don't read like supernatural or fantasy things very often, so maybe my mind's been just trained to, you know, to accept those things because right. I'm not used to it. Right. Um, in my books, but yeah, I had I could picture him with the horns. Mm -hmm. I could picture him even, you know, when he goes to the river, he gets burnt and then goes into the river and comes out and he's flesh. Oh, is red. right. I yeah, I was thinking that. Of that too. Um, but this whole all the events at the foundry with the snakes and even like the last kind of scene where, I mean, the meet, last movie scene, the scene of the book where everybody dies, you know, um, I had trouble picturing it, I don't know, mm -hmm. snakes everywhere. And right, and, and I think we talked about before, well, was this done because all along Joe Hill had in mind that maybe we could have a movie from this, you know, that, I mean, it was pretty cinematic, mm -hmm. and, it, yeah, it was. and maybe it works well in the film those scenes, if they're in there. I haven't seen the movie yet, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Well, like you guys, I, I liked the horns, and I could see the horns, and I could feel the horns. I thought there was really good writing about that, mm -hmm. um, you know, when they were, like, red and inflamed, and, and the snakes I was even along with. Yeah, then okay. the boundary, I was like, where is this coming from? It just sort of, it all sort of fell apart for me when it just exploded. Exploded. Um, even when he came back after being burned alive, I was like, "Oh, now he's, now he's, you know, he's, you can't kill him either." I thought maybe he just had, and now he's uh, superhuman. Um, right. So I struggled with that stuff for me. Mm -hmm. right. And then I wondered if it was all a dream because everything else seemed pretty real up until that point. And then he comes back and has, like you said, supernatural powers. Um, I thought about that too. I was wondering, well, is this just a dream? Are we going to find out that uh, you know this didn't happen really this in real life? Yeah. He's just waking mm -hmm. up from his drunk. Right. Uh, drunk I, thought he, I thought that maybe he was going to wake up from the big drunk night and be the sequel. Yeah, the sequel. <laughs> okay. No, it's all just a, all just a dream. Mm -hmm. um, going back to kind of the biblical references, the scene where, um, and this is very cinematic too, the scene where he's younger and the first time he meets Lee and Glenna and he's going down in the shopping cart oh, yeah. and, um, and Lee pulls him out of the water almost like to me it was like a baptism of some kind oh, you know, okay. in this, he falls in the water and Lee right I don't know yeah I don't know that many but did you why do you think Lee saved him I mean Lee's we know he's pretty evil by then because I think by that point he had already had the pitchfork incident with the cat on the fence and right. Well, don't we find out that Lee didn't really save him? I thought that you know he he denies it. He denies it a number of times, and I thought later in the book we find out that Lee didn't actually save him. That what was it? Do you remember, Angelina? I can't quite remember. I vaguely remember that it wasn't necessarily that Lee saved him. Is that that he washed up on his own and everyone saw him with Ig? Right. I think okay. That happened. Yeah. I, that was a little fuzzy. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and then I, I remember uh the play in words that, that Joe Hill used with the horns. Of course the horns that it grew, but also the trumpets that are horns. And um even the name parish made me think of a parish of a church mm -hmm. or, you know, dying, you're going to perish. So it's kind of clever the things that he uh, he chose, names he chose, and kind of the tools that he used to to use in the book. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, in my mind, it was interesting the fact that you could kind of tell something was off with Lee, like very early on in his early conversations with Ig after he pulls him out of the river and they, you know, he comes over to his house to borrow music and all those right. things. Right. Um, but Ig was just so. I don't know if he was naive because he was so young, but he just seemed very, um, he just seemed very, like, blind, blinded as to all this evil that was in mm -hmm. Lee. I mean, Lee was even talking about, 
you could see his like misogynistic side coming out in his early conversations with Ig, mm -hmm. talking about women and how right he likes to work with groups right stuff. I mean, right, and Ig just seemed to like push all that aside in his mind. Right. I think Ig did seem very innocent, and you know they were talking about the Beatles and how Ig loved the Beatles and really all music and. And Lee didn't, but the only Beatles song he, he did like was the what's the one Happiness about is Happiness is a Warm Gun and and Lee liked A C D C because it would be good music to kill people to. Just a real real dichotomy of, of the two of them. It being so innocent, just a nice music lover who wants to lend his CDs mm -hmm. to Lee and Lee just wants to kill listen to the music that he could kill people yeah. by. Well and even when um when he's selling the magazines and Ig thinks, oh, Lee must be poor because he's right. selling these magazines right. and these little prizes. And then it turns out he's actually pretty well-to-do and he lives in a good neighborhood and he right. has two parents that are still married and all this stuff. And Ig still, I mean, it still doesn't really dawn on him. Right. But, like, this, he's not right about this kid. Right, right. Um, so we hope you'll submit your questions, everybody in the audience. Um, we like to hear what you have to say about the book. Um, I don't know. Um, you brought up a good quote by Joe Hill that you had seen in um, an interview about I think it's if all fiction is make believe, then writers should not deny themselves great metaphors like ghosts and angels and devils. Oh, right, right. And that made me think about all those figurines in, well, we didn't even talk about that. What was the Treehouse of the Mind or something? Yeah, it's that a huge. Be, that's a whole other another thing that we haven't even delved into yet, but. I remember those figurines, and I kind of felt like they probably all, all something. I think one was, was there a Virgin Mary? And I thought mm -hmm. one represented Marin. And did, did you? Because then he even said one looked like his brother, like there was an angel playing a, right, tri playing a trumpet. Yeah, and looked like his brother. And then at the end, he goes back to the Treehouse of the Mind, and he sees the devil, who actually, he says, looks kind of not, not nice, but, you know, Jovial or yeah, something, like, something that. like that. Um and I don't know, it's just interesting. I just right. kinda thought they were all modeled after maybe somebody that he knew. Right, right. We've got a question. And uh, it says, I just noticed the musical references in the book that refer to the Rolling Stones song, Simply for the Devil. Yes, I remember that. And you can't always get what you want. Fitting choices. Absolutely. Yeah. And right. actually one of the last little sections of the book, um, it's called the Gospel According to Nick and Keith, um, right. referring to the Rolling Stones, um, which I assume was somebody didn't, some one of the characters did mention the lyrics. You can't always get what you want. Mm -hmm. um, it got what he wanted in the end. In the end, I mean, well, what he really wanted was Marin back, of course. Yeah. Um, which he kind of got. Even well, it was right, Earth, right, that's right, and and he he got justice. He he. Well, let's see, does, did he see Lee die? I think so. I've, although he hadn't stabbed at that point. I don't know how. Right, right. Yeah. What did you think, Angeline? Do you think that Ig, everything was okay with Ig in the end? I mean, is he happy with the way things played out? Um, They made it seem that way. I mean, if I was Ig, I wouldn't be happy with how everything turned out. But it's, you say you would be? I would. I wouldn't have been. Oh, you wouldn't have been. I would. I would not have been. But um, but it, I mean, ultimately, he wanted to be with Marin, and he right. and he wanted. He was thirteen years old, so essentially, he got to be with her again. And his right. brother actually found out the truth, um, or and then Lee died. So I I guess I hoped that his name would be cleared through mm -hmm. someone telling somebody the right thing or something. Right. But, right. And I did kind of, I thought it was nice of Ig to kind of leave his brother without any mem memory well, of what really, yes. I mean, he remembered what happened with Eric and Lee getting killed, but he didn't really remember the horns or anything. Right, Which okay. is, you know, I think that was... That was admirable. Good we, we were talking earlier about the end of the book where uh, Terry goes, comes back to town and goes to the foundry and Glenn is there, and I thought, oh, gosh... Here we go, another relationship now. These two are going to get together, and I just. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do feel kind of bad for Glenna. She seems, she, she's like she's trying to hold on to like somebody, right? You know, just Poor find Glenna. somebody that's good to her. And I mean, Ig, 
it said like earlier on in the book that she knew that Egg didn't really love her, but she almost didn't mind because right. Yeah. You know, just, when you asked earlier if there were characters, or I guess I mentioned that the author thought we should at least care about some characters. Like I guess I kind of got to care about Glenna. Yeah. <laughs> Although she was, I don't know. When you first meet her, she's just this kind of tomboy, and they're. In that whole donut scene at the very beginning, I did not exactly get then that it was her being honest about her desire to eat donuts. Yeah. Well, when I first, the first time I read the book, the first like two chapters, like what is going yeah, what on? is Why going are these on? People telling their darkest secrets, like the um, the people in the waiting room. At the oh, right. Office. That was pretty horrible. That was pretty horrible. <laughs> what was? What do you think the worst? Like, what was the most disturbing secret, if you can remember? But. I almost, I almost think it was that scene in the, I guess it was the emergency room or the, you know, place, the minute clinic, not the minute clinic, but anyway, we'll call it the emergency room where, where that mother was just being so brutally honest about how much <laughs> she hated, did, her. Yeah, hated her child. Did you have a, um, a favorite secret, Angeline, that people revealed to Abe? Well, it wasn't. Well, what's what's the little girl? When she was confessing how much she like hated her mom, like I just found that mm -hmm. I know it wasn't funny, but it was funny to me. Um, mm -hmm. I wish there would have been more of that throughout the book. I mean, there was some, um, you know, he, his his father confesses, his mother confesses, his brother does. Um, the wait does he go back and the waitress does? What? Well, yeah, but I wanted to do more yeah. of confessions like that out in public, and you would have liked more confessions. Yeah, I wanted to see more confessions. <laughs> I was kind of just cringing, you know, when he, he was another character thinking, mm -hmm. oh no, now we're going to find out these horrible truths. Like, yeah. Just, I have to say, the saddest for me was um, Marin's father. Or oh. either Marin's father or the store clerk that wanted to push his wife. His wife had dementia or Alzheimer's. And, oh, right. Um, he wanted to push her down the stairs. I think that was the saddest. Right. And right. And he tells him, yeah, you're a horrible person. Right, but right. It does kind of make you think, what do people in those situations actually <laughs> kind of scarred me a little bit? Like, what are, what are people actually thinking right now? Um, I, speaking of pushing, there was the scene where Ig pushes his grandmother down the hill. That was that was pretty pretty awful. And we find out that she's okay, which was which was good. Yeah. But uh, she wasn't a very nice person either. At least her her truths were were not very very nice after. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ig that they had this wonderful relationship. <laughs> Apparently, Grandma wasn't so nice. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but how would you classify this book? I mean, it's on the back they refer to it as a natural thriller. Um, but Joe Hill's kind of known for his horror, I guess. I mean, he kind of writes in different. Well, genres, he he writes humor too. I yeah, bet. Yeah. So I think you were you were really spot on when you said that it was really a mix of genres. Did did you feel that way too, Angeline? Um, I know it was billed as a horror, but in in more of a supernatural thriller, um, or maybe even horror light, horror light. Right. You said you were never scared at any point, and I, I agree. I, mm -hmm. There was no, no time that I really was, you know, really scared and yeah. thinking and I'm about. Yeah, I'm easily scared. <laughs> but, although I did, um, the the times when um, Egg is able to kind of mimic other people, their voices, I thought, oh my gosh, this would be really creepy in a movie to see. Daniel yes. Radcliffe talking, and then this woman's voice coming out. I thought that would have been yes. really scary. To yes, see. yes. Although I thought, um, I don't know if I remember this quite right, but I read an interview with, with Joe Hill where he talks about old horror movies and how now horror movies are kind of just like action, 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 mm -hmm. and the old ones, I think you mentioned maybe they're more humor or you really hmm. need to care about the characters. So maybe he is, this is kind of a throwback to those old horror movies, you know, right. in that style. Right, right. Yeah, I was really curious about Joe Hill's interest, certainly in in music, and I was interested in what his religious beliefs were, like you mentioned. And I, yeah, really curious to know a little bit more about him. We have another question. Oh, so, Patrick asks, do you think Horns will turn out successful as a movie? Um, I'm not sure. I think the casting, the casting choices look good. What do you think? Because we have um, 
Daniel Radcliffe as Ig. Right. I think we actually have a trailer that we're going to show just um, without the sound here, but I think Daniel Radcliffe is a good choice. I could picture him as this innocent teenager. That's a good point. But also right. as, um, as somebody who's kind of like fallen, mm -hmm. you know, fallen right. apart a little bit. And right. Kind of Right. Yes, I agree completely. Yeah. I think it probably was a good casting choice, and he looks. I guess I saw a picture of him with his horns, and actually, that wasn't the way I initially envisioned the horns, but it, it's better than my vision. I think <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, makeup people did a good job. <laughs> and I think Juno Temple is the um, is Marin. Okay. So I don't really know her for much, but just looking at the trailer, you can see she's kind of. I mean, she kind of fits like the. The innocent, you mm -hmm. know, look of Marin. Um, Angeline, do you have any thoughts on the casting? Um, I've seen the tra I've seen the trailer, and I, I I agree with the casting that Daniel Radcliffe was was a good pick, and I have seen some of the other actors, um, and I think they were good picks too. Um, I know the father from Dexter is um, Ig's dad, and oh I mean, right, and um. But I didn't recognize the other characters. Um, I thought the the vis from what I saw from the trailer again, um, the colors and the settings were really good. Um, mm. This is how I pictured it in my mind as being very bright, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very right. crisp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like. I did see that Dexter's dad was going to be the father, and I thought that was interesting. <laughs> um, he was a good father. I could kind of picture him as the the successful musician, but also. Like down to her dad, kind of. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'm really excited to see, like you mentioned, like the horns right. sprouting from his head and his red his skin turning red and all of that. I think the visual effects should be good. Right. Right. Um, so I think we're close to wrapping up. Um, I hope you all enjoyed our discussion. If you did like horns, there are a bunch of other books that are similar. Um, we have a link in our showcase to um, some of our recommended read-alikes for horns. Um, I know we were talking about the humor. Christopher Moore is a good one. He's right. humorous, but also writes some sometimes like supernatural things. Um, his book "You Suck" is a good read-alike right. think, for this. Right. And um, actually, I read uh, Gillian Flynn's "Dark Places" mm. um, earlier this summer, and it kind of, even though it's not really horror at all, it's more of a I guess a thriller. Um, it reminded me of this because it has the dark. There's something like devil worshiping at some point, okay. and there's a, a mystery to it. Um, uh, girls trying to figure out who killed her family. Mm. She she pinned it on her brother years ago, and now she's kind of second guessing herself. So mm. it kind of has that going for it too. It made it kind of. Would similar. you recommend that title? Yeah, it was good. I didn't. I read Gone Girl, so I didn't like it as much as Gone Girl. Okay. It wasn't as fast paced, I think, but it was. It was good, and the way like, there's this one scene where she writes about a character throwing up spaghetti, and it's just <laughs> I was reading on my lunch break, and I had to stop because <laughs> it was just too graphic for me. Okay. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of fun, fun tonight, and thanks for joining us for our discussion. And uh, thanks, Angeline, for joining us. It was really a lot of fun. My and pleasure. Um, our next Google Hangout is going to be taking place on Monday, November 24th at seven o'clock. Um, we'll be discussing the YA novel Sex and Violence by Carrie Mesrobian, and we're actually going to be interviewing the author before the Hangout, um, so if you have any questions you'd like us to ask her, you can write them in the comments section for the November Hangout. Um, if you get those to us by November 14th, we'll try to include them in our interview. So we hope you join us for the next Google Hangout on November 24th. Thanks. Thanks a lot.